Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining today's Appian Community Webinar. Uh, today's presentation, we will focus on one of the new features that we added to Power Builder 2017 R2, Source Control with Git. Uh, in this presentation, uh, Bruce Armstrong, the Appian MVP, will share his experience of working with the native interface in uh, 2017 R2 to the uh, Git Source Control system. So before we start this presentation, uh, I will put up a quick disclaimer to make sure you are aware that this is a community webcast and it is a volunteer basis and the view presented here are formed by the author. So you can start to ask the questions now by clicking the question mark here and you can start to uh, type your questions. We will try our best to answer all your questions now, and if we cannot finish all the questions, we will send our answers later by email. So the first thing we're going to do is look at our agenda. Um, I'm going to talk about me for a few minutes, or a few seconds really, uh, who I am, who I work for, why you would want to listen to me. Then we're going to talk about the history of support for source code control in Power Builder, how we got to where we are today. Uh, we'll look at what we need to install to get started with Git. We're going to create a repository in Git. We're going to add the Power Builder project to the Git repository. Then we're going to examine what's really a new feature under the way that uh, Git and Subversion were implemented in Power Builder 2017 or 2. Um, there's a new fe this new feature is uh, the ability for a new developer to go in and connect to workspace, connect to the, to the source code repository, and pull down everything they need to get started, um, including you know the workspace file and the pibbles, which is not possible under the old MSS CCI approach. Then once we've got a couple of different workspaces set up so we can simulate uh, two different developers making changes to uh, code, we're going to look to see what happens uh, when two developers make changes to the same object at the same time. Um, that can result in a merge conflict. And so we're gonna see what happens there and how we might avoid such merge conflicts. And then we'll have a question and answer session. So just a little bit on me. I think most people on the call probably know who I am. I've been around for a long time talking about Power Builder. Um, back in the Team PowerSoft days, the uh, Team Sybase, uh, um, SAP Mentor, uh, Appian MPV now. Uh, what that means is that I spend a lot of time in forums, uh, writing tech articles, blog posts, doing webcasts like this, doing the um, presentations in front of user groups and at the annual conference. Just doing a lot of stuff like that to, to uh, share information about how to use Power Builder. The company I work for is called Integrated Data Services. Prior to that, I was an independent contractor. Um, they started in 1997. I joined them in 2004. Um, they started out with a, you know, their, with their bread and butter app is a Power Builder client server application. Um, it, about three or four years ago, we converted that primarily over to HTML5 JavaScript, although um, we do have customers who still prefer to use the client server version. So we, su we still support that, and so we're still doing Power Builder work. Okay. So let's talk about the history of source code, code control in Power Builder. Originally, there wasn't any. I can remember shops back in the early days of Power Builder um, where if you wanted to use source code control, you would check your pibbles in the source code. And then if a developer wanted to work on, on an object, they would have to check out the pibble it was in, which meant that no other developer could do work in that same pibble until that developer was done. Um, that was less than ideal. Because um, oftentimes what you'd have is, is developer A would, would check out a library, start working in an object in it. Developer B would check out a different library, start working that. They each would then realize that they needed to work with objects that were being used, in, that were in the library used by the other developer. And one of them would have to release their lock so the other developer could finish their changes so then they could go back and make the changes they needed to make. Um, yeah, less than ideal. Uh, about the Power Builder three days, PowerSoft recognized that was an issue. 
that we needed some ability to do more granular source code control. We needed to be able to get down to an object level. Uh, so developers only have to lock individual objects and could make changes to individual objects and other developers could work in that same library. And so what they did is they implemented um, native drivers for specific large source code control vendors at the time. Uh, one of them, for instance, was PVCS. And that, um, that was certainly an improvement over what we've been doing before, but there were still some issues with it. One of the issues uh, we had, uh, we were using PVCS originally, is that we would be using a particular version of PVCS that the Parabellar worked well with. Um, PVCS would come out with a new version of their product. Um, it, they had some changes in the API, their native API, and Parabellar was not compatible with that new version. And we would have to wait until Parabellar was updated to support that that new version of the of the driver, the native driver, before we could actually move to it, so that that was an issue. And for a lot of people, there was an even bigger issue. Um, their the particular vendor might not have been supported by uh, PowerBuilder. For instance, uh, Subversion. Um, there was no until uh, 2017 R2 came out. There was no native uh, Subversion um, driver. I mentioned Subversion, because Subversion's been around a long time. It's uh, a bit newer. So if you had a source control system that you were already using and and you wanted to use PowerBuilder with it, um, if, if PowerBuilder didn't support it, you couldn't use it for, from PowerBuilder. You'd have to use something else for PowerBuilder. And that was that's just you know rather inconvenient. So once again, realizing there was an issue, and because of something Microsoft had developed uh, uh, in the interim, uh, in PowerBuilder 6, um, the native, the vendor-specific drivers were dropped from PowerBuilder. And instead, support was added for what was called the Microsoft Source Co Code Control Interface, MSS CCI. What that essentially was, it was a standard that Microsoft introduced that provided an API that source control vendors would provide, and then the tool would, would match that API essentially an ODBC for version control. So now the syntax by way, way which you talk to the source control system is standardized. And what that means, as long as your vendor supports the MSS CCI API, you could use it. And it didn't matter what version of that product it was because you were always talking through these standardized API calls. Uh, it also meant, though, that if your product didn't support MSS CCI, that a third-party vendor could step into the, in the, uh, the breach and create a bridge product that would take the MSS CCI API calls and convert them to the native um, um, API calls for the product that didn't support MSS CCI. And, and a big example of that is Subversion, and, and for that matter, Git. Um, there are bridge products out there available that you could have been using prior to 2017 R2 that would have allowed you to uh, talk to Subversion or Git um, by translating the MSS CCI API calls to the native uh, Subversion and Git calls. But that's no longer necessary because in Power Builder 2017 R2, Appion introduced uh, native drivers for Subversion and Git. Now, a uh, couple of reasons for that. One of them is that the, the um, marketplace has really changed quite a bit um, in the source control area. A lot of those big vendors like PVCS are no longer involved in source control. Um, instead, what's taken their place are open source version control systems. And the two big players are Subversion and Git. So uh, the time was ripe to go ahead and, and add native drivers for Subversion and Git. Uh, the other item is that because uh, this is a native call, rather than going through the MSS CCI, um, this should be faster than going through those bridge products, and it also removes your dependency on a third-party product that uh, may not be uh, well supported. I should mention that in 2018, Power Builder, uh, the Power Builder 2018 product, there will be additional changes to source code control support. Uh, they'll be adding a native driver for Team Foundation Server. Now, Team Foundation Server itself isn't source control system. It has two different source control systems built into it. The first, which is the default when you create a new project, is actually Git. 
So if that's what you're using, you can use the 2017 R2 Git driver that, that is already available. If, however, you're using Team Foundation version control, which is the legacy product that uh, Microsoft developed to support Visual Studio, um, you'll have to wait till probably 2018 to uh, use a native driver for that. Uh, what you can do today is there is an MSS CCI bridge product available. It's from, available from Microsoft um, that allows PowerBuilder to talk to Team Foundation version control. Okay. So enough history. Let's see what do we need to do to start working with Git. Well, the first thing we need to do is get a Git server. Now, there's the number of products out there. Um, most of them, like like I mentioned earlier, are, are open source, although they may have a a um, paid support um, enterprise uh, version of their product as well, or they may uh, they may charge for using for private repositories rather than public repositories. The most of them either have an on premise or a cloud solution. The one we're going to use for this demo is called Bonobo Git. Um, it is on it is a on prem solution only. It doesn't have a, a cloud solution. Um, some of those other vendors I mentioned um, earlier, not by name, but the, the names are uh, GitHub, GitLab, uh, Perforce uh, Helix Team Hub, and uh, Microsoft Foundation, uh, Team Foundation Server. Uh, one I didn't put in the slides here is also is uh, Bitbucket. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of options out there, and you can use any of them. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, most of those, um, actually all the, all the ones I've got listed there offer both a cloud and on a premise solution. The other thing we're going to put on is Tortoise Git. Now, we're going to put that on each developer's work, uh, workstation. And the reason we're going to want to do that is because there are, once you get to using Git, um, there are a large number of options available. And not all those options are ever going to show up in the Power IDE. For example, um, maybe you're working with an object and you're on version 10 of that object. Um, but because of some bug that's come up, you want to go back and you want to look to see what changes do, did we make between the version 2 and version 3 of that object. Well, that's not going to be available to you to navigate to through the PowerBuilder IDE. Tortoise Git allows you to do that. Now, you could go to the Git command line and type in commands that would give you that information as well. I don't like to do that. I, I'm a, I'm a you know, kind of a gooey guy. That's why I do power builder work. Um, I like to point and click my way through things. And so I like to use Tortoise Git. Um, it's uh, open source. It's a plugin for Windows Explorer, which means what we do is we go into Windows Explorer. We navigate into the local copy of the source code, uh, right click on the object we're interested in or the folder we're interested in. And on the pop-up that shows up in Windows Explorer, you'll find Git options there that you can then use. So it makes it a lot easier to use Git. And as I mentioned, it, it's there to support the Git operations that aren't supported by the PowerBuilder IDE. So we're going to look at creating a repository in Git. And at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to a virtual machine. So this is my virtual machine. Now, now what I've done here, I've actually installed um, Bonobo on the, on the virtual machine. Uh, you know, you wouldn't do, do that in normal practice. Um, I'm just doing this for this demo. It's an ASP.NET application. Um, it has a, this fairly easy to use uh, UI, which is one of the reasons I like it. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new repository. And the main thing you just need to give it is name. I'm going to call it Git Beta. Now, that actually is the name of my workspace in PowerBuilder, and there's a reason that you're going to want to do that. We'll get into that a little bit later. The other thing is I've already created a couple users in this system, and I'm just going to indicate their contributors. And that will be useful when we go to simulate two different developers making changes to the same object. I'm going to hit Create, and it's created the repository. This little icon here next to the repository. Here's the repository here. That little icon allows me to copy the repository URL. That's what we're going to, that's what we're going to use to get our, our um, source code up to the server. Okay, so let's go to PowerBuilder now, and here I have a project that I want to add to source control. So now, normally, what you do under MSS CCI is you would right-click here, go to the properties for the workspace, and on the source control tab, you'd see uh, the name of a product here. Um, we're not going to do that. 
Um, that's not the way it's implemented with uh, the, this version or Git. We're going to right click on the workspace and use this new add to source control option. And uh, the dialog that comes up here will now show us subversion or Git. We're going to select Git. It'll ask for the uh, name and our name and, and uh, email to use on the commits. Now, uh, it's important to notice this some interesting things about this dialog. This is the objects that Power Builders are attempting or getting ready to check in to, uh, to Git. Now, when you're using MSS CCI, if you were using that before, uh, what was often recommended is that you take each Pibble in your workspace and put it into a separate subfolder of the workspace. And the reason you did that is because what PowerBuilder would do when you want to use source control is it would export every object in each Pibble into the library, into the folder that Pibble was in. And having all the source code for all the, the libraries all in the same folder Caused, it caused performance issues with MSS CCI, and it also um, ran some, in, in some possibility that you would get objects that might have the same name and, and overwrite each other. So um, that was why you wanted the one folder per Pibble approach. Now, with this new method that they've come up with, uh, with Subversion and Git, you don't need to do that because what it does in the background is it handles that for you. So there's this WS Objects folder that gets created for you. And then underneath that, there's a folder for each Pibble in the workspace. And then underneath that, those, those are the actual source code objects that are gonna get checked in. Okay. Now, the other thing you may notice here, there's a lot more being committed than we would normally get under MSS CCI. The Pibbles are being committed. The workspace files being committed. That's for that new feature I talked about earlier where a new developer would come, can come in, connect to source control, get all these objects, and start working immediately. Under MSS CCI, the only objects that got checked in the source control were just these raw source code files. And so when a new developer came in, when they did the pull from source control, that's all they got. And they would have to um, either get a copy of Pibbles from another developer, or maybe use uh, Orca Script to do a create from source to create the Pibbles from the raw source code. And so uh, with, like I said, with the, this new implementation, we'll see here in a minute where a new developer can get started much or, much quicker. Now, if if having the pibbles and workspace file in the source code isn't something you're interested in doing, you don't have to do it. Uh, that's why these checkboxes are here. You can just deselect those and, and they won't be included. Uh, but I'm gonna leave them on because I wanna demonstrate that new feature. So I'm gonna say here, initial commit. Now, what you may be wondering now is what happened to that repository URL? I never told PowerBuilder where the server was at. So how did I commit the source code? Um, that's where Git is a bit different from most other source control systems. And uh, to understand that, we need to go back to the slides for a minute. I'm gonna for fast forward here to this slide. This slide is, is essentially a diagram of how Git operates. You notice it says remote repository, and then down here it says local repository. And all of this actually exists on this other developer's workstation as well. There's not one repository in this situation. There's three. There's one on each of the developer's machines, and then there's the remote repository. And these, these repositories are considered peer to one another. Um, the way that source code is moved between them is once you've done a commit to your local repository, you do a push to a remote repository. The other developer can do a pull to get the changes you've made and push their changes. Okay, so there's another operation we need to do here to get their code to the remote repository. And there can actually be several remote repositories. You might have, um, let's say, um, you've got offices on the East Coast and the West Coast and they might have a remote repository apiece, and then you've got a sync process running between those two repositories. Um, you might have um, operations in the United States and in Europe, and each has their own repository, and there's a sync process operating between those. So it's, it's a distributed uh, source control system with a bunch of different repositories, all that are considered peers to one another. 
And that's, that's where locking becomes an issue. Because the repositories are all peers, there's no one repository that's the master that can say a user has this object locked. Um, so yeah, most Git implementations don't provide any locking capability. The nice thing about this, because your, local, your, your repository is local, is you can do development um, disconnected from the remote repository. You can do make your changes, you can do commits, and then when you get connected back to the network again later, you can do your push and your, and your pull to uh, sync back up with the remote repository. So there are some advantages to this, even though it, it, for people coming from the older MSS CCI approach, this seems a little weird. Let's go back to our virtual machine. So <clears throat> we realize we're, we're going to need to push to get the, the code up to source control. There's one thing I want to touch on before I, go, before I do that, though. Remember I showed you the workspace properties and how Git wasn't there? Now it is. I believe the reason it does that is because it allows you to go in and change these settings later. And notice the repository, remote repository right here is blank. That's going to be changed here in just a minute. So right now, we're going to try to do a push. When we try to do a push, the first time we try to do it for this, this workspace, we're going to get this dialog. It won't show up again. This is where we use the repository URL. This, is, this configures the local repository to know where its remote repository is at. So I could paste in the URL there. And notice, uh, like I said before, that I made the, the name of the workspace the same as the name of the repository. And that's because PowerBuild is trying to put together the repository URL based on the workspace name. That's where this get beta came from. That's my workspace name. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to backspace that off. So now it's just the base URL plus the workspace name makes the um, repository URL. See how that works? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say test connection and it's going to fail. Now, the reason it's going to fail is specific to Bonobo server and one other server actually, Team Foundation server. Most of those other Git uh, vendors we mentioned before, uh, GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, this would have worked fine. The, raw, the problem, and if we bring a notepad back up, is notice that, that this .git extension after the name of the workspace. Bonobo and Team Foundation Server care about that. They don't like not getting that .git. <clears throat> That's actually not a huge issue, because like I said, this is a one-time configuration. It's for setting the remote repository in the local repository, and that's something we can do from Git, uh, uh, towards Git. And so we don't have to do it here through PowerBuilder. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to exit the PowerBuilder IDE. And the reason I did that is I want to make sure that when PowerBuilder gets this change I'm about to make, and it reads that when you when you first open the workspace. So here's the Git beta folder, uh, which is also the local repository. I'm going to right click on it. Here's Tortoise Git. Uh, I'm going to go to the settings down near the bottom. And here it says remote. And here we can type in the remote repository. Hit apply. Hit no to this um, dialog. I'll hit OK. I'll bring Power Builder back up. If we go check the workspace settings now, you'll notice that it's configured the, um, the remote repository for us. And so we can push. And there you go. Our changes are in in uh, towards Git. I mean, sorry, in uh, in uh, Bonobo. So if we go to our repository and look at the commits, there we see our initial commit. There's everything that got sent up. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's go take a look at that new feature I talked about. I'm going to close this workspace, and now with no workspace uh, open, I'm going to pretend I'm that new developer that's come on. And I need to get start working with this project. So I'm going to set file. There's a new option here, connect to workspace. I'm going to click on that. I'm going to say git. I'm going to put in my git URL. And um, once again, 
if because this is uh, Bonobo, this is actually not going to work. Um, and Team Foundation Server. Uh, once again, GitHub, GitLab, that would have all worked. Once again, this is a one-time configuration, and we can do this through Tortoise Git. So I'm going to close this. I'm going to go back to Windows Explorer. I'm going to go to the folder here and create a new, actually a new folder. I'm going to call it Git Beta 2. That's going to be my second workspace. Right-click on it. I'm going to hit Git Clone. That's that's the name of the operation for pulling, doing the initial pull of, of source code down to the local workstation. So I do a git clone, and I just wanted to go into the git beta folder directly. Git beta 2 folder directly, I should say. I hit OK. And now if I go look in that folder, I've got all my pibbles, I've got my workspace, I've got everything I needed to get started on this project. So I'm going to say file open workspace. I'm going to go to the Git2 folder, and uh, we're ready to go. Um, one thing I, I, I believe I need to do here, though, is do a... Well, so I didn't need to do it. Okay, let me check the workspace properties. Sometimes you need to do a uh, add the source code uh, again, just to just to make sure that uh, Power Builder is in sync with with Git, but it looks like we may be okay here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna simulate changes to um, the this object by two different developers. So in this one, I've got this nice bright red window, and uh, the users are complaining about that. So I'm gonna change that to button face, and I'm gonna save that. Notice this check mark comes up. Now that check mark does not mean I have the object locked. Remember, Git doesn't do locking uh, for the most part. What it all it means is that I've got an uncommitted change. So I'm going to go ahead and commit that change. Changed uh, background color. So there's one developer making one change to that object. Okay, and now I'm going to go into the other workspace original workspace. I'm going to open that object up. I'm going to change the title and save that. And I'm going to commit that. Remember all, remember, all commit does change color. No title, sorry, change title. All commit does is save to the local repository. We still need to push those changes to the remote repository. So I'm going to push the change here, and that worked fine. Okay, I'm going to go back to the other workspace. I'm going to push, and I get an error message down here. Reference was not fast forwardable. That's Git's way of telling you that another developer has made a change to the object since I originally pulled it down. And made my change. And what I need to do is I need to pull down those changes and merge them in. So I'm going to right click here. I'm going to do a pull. And Git automatically merged the changes for me. In fact, I did not get a merge conflict because Git was able to figure out that the two changes were, were compatible and made them both. In fact, to prove that, I'm going to open this window and you'll notice I've got the gray background color and I've got the change title. The one thing I still need to do here is I need to push my change back up to the server. And now the server has uh, both changes. Okay, so in this particular case, Git was a lot smarter. If, if anybody saw the webcast from last week, you realize some versions had, had problems with this and that we had to go and do a, a merge changes manually to fit to piece together what part of what changes uh, were going to be accepted into the uh, final commit. Um, we didn't have to do that here. Now, if two developers made changes to the same object and in the same same uh, method in the same object, you would probably have a merge conflict. But it looks like uh, the chances of getting merge conflicts are a lot less with Git than, let's, with, let's say, Subversion. Um, at least uh, if you're not doing locking in Subversion. 
But we do want to keep them to, to a minimum because they are painful to deal with. And so we're going to go back to the slides for a minute and look to see how we, uh, how we uh, prevent or at least uh, reduce the number of merge conflicts we get. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, merge conflicts do require manual editing the source code. It's best to avoid them completely if possible. Um, one issue is under both subversion and get, there's no refresh, automatic refresh operation. There is a refresh option in the Powerbuilder menu, but it, it, it's something you do manually. Uh, under MSS CCI, Powerbuilder would, would you know, go out and pull the the source control system on a regular basis to see if there were any changes and would mark the objects as not being in sync with what was in source control. But we don't do that under subversion and Git. Um, so what you want to do, uh, and just as a rule of thumb, is make sure that you do a refresh before you go to edit an object. Because if some other you, uh, developers made a change to the object and committed it and pushed it to the repository and you start editing without checking doing the refresh first you've caused a merge conflict just because you didn't do the refresh so do the refresh first before you go ahead and and, uh, and uh, uh, start working on an object there are uh, some options though um, there are, there's a product called GitLab Enterprise. This is a, a paid version of the open source GitLab where they do implement file locking if that's something you really feel you need to have. There's also a product called Gitalite. Now what Gitalite does is it actually sits as, uh, as a, a, a interface between your local development environment and the um, Git repository and adds the fi the fire the file locking layer for you. Okay, so that's uh, that's a couple of different approaches you might consider as well. But based on what we've seen so far, it doesn't appear that the merge conflicts are going to be anywhere near as significant if you're using Git than than under Subversion. So you may find that you can run Git and and not deal not implement any of these special solutions to do locking and not have a problem. Okay, um, so in summary, um, the Git interface provided in PowerBuilder 2016 R2 um, eliminates use, need to use bridge products through MSSCI, allowing you to use Git natively because it is native, it is faster than um, the bridge products, and it should provide more complete uh, Git support. Uh, but it does bring some complexity to the development experience, particularly uh, dealing with merge conflicts. Although we didn't see one here, there, there is some possibility for that happening. Okay, time for questions.